Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I'm Melissa Spradlin. I'm the executive director at Political, and um, I invited some of my board members to come so that they could keep me on my toes. No, they're wonderful. So Chris Boyd is with us. He is our president of the Book Home Board of Directors right now. Works at the Fowler Group of Raymond James. Thank you for taking time to come. And Joyce Fox. Joyce is retired. Um, has been a volunteer with Book Home for several years. Kind of does a little bit of everything with Book Home. And we love her and appreciate all that she does. And she is, um, this is her first year on our board. Chris has been on the board for several years. Um, and Lindsay Bryant is also here. Lindsay is our Young Leaders Council intern. So we thought that she asked if she could come as this is a good experience with her internship with us. Um, she is a process engineer, some sort of engineer. Civil engineer. Civil engineer with uh, Smith Second and Reed. <laughs> yes. so, so thank you all for taking time to come. I appreciate it. So, um, you know, I had a hard time trying to figure out what to talk about, to be honest, because I was like, well, they've got the proposal, they've read it, they know all that. So I decided on a few things that I thought might help you with making your decisions, because I do know it's very hard when you have all these great proposals, because most of them probably are, are truly good um, and will make a difference. What is important about us? that makes a difference um, and, and can sway you to say, yeah, we definitely need to do this one. Um, we do two things at Bookham. We are all about children's literacy. That's it. We give away books to um, kids, we make them proud book owners that are picking out books that they really are going to love to read. We train reading role models. So we put volunteers in classrooms, um, at pre-K centers, and elementary schools. Um, people, actually like, like these folks over here, <laughs> who really share their love of reading and books with these kids, motivate the kids to want to read, to love reading, to work a little harder at it, um, and to have books that they really do want to read, that they're going to love. Um, that's what we do. We want to get kids excited about reading. We want them to discover that reading is fantastic, as we all know it is. Um, and we want them to have some of the tools they need to discover that. Um, we only serve Davidson County. Um, we focus on lower income families that live in Davidson County and the entire county. So we're not looking at just a specific geographic region in the county. We actually serve Madison, Goodlettsville, Joelton, Antioch, everybody. Um, as long as they're lower income and they live in Davidson County. Um, our mission, our values, our values and our, our vision, they really do guide our work. Um, they are really important to us as an organization and our board looks at them pretty much every year to decide are they still true for us where we are today? We really do want all kids to know the value and joy of reading. And we want them to discover that through great books that they have decided they want to own and exposure to people who really do love books and reading. We play well with others, and that's really important. Collaboration is key to making a difference with literacy. We know we are not going to solve children's literacy in Davidson County by ourselves. We're not. But together, we can. So we work with lots of different groups, a hundred different government agencies, schools, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, anybody pretty much in town that cares about children's literacy. They can partner with us in some way. Um, we have reading role models in 14 metro schools. Um, one of those is a pre-K center. The other are elementary schools. And the district has asked us to expand our programs, all of them, as much as we can. So there's real value in the community to what we do. We're pretty much the only group 
that that's quite what we do, um, especially on the scale that we do it on. Um, let's see. We have relationships with lots of different groups in town, um, and that's important. I serve on a lot of different committees. Um, I've been doing this for 10 years, and it helps. Um, it helps to, to know that I can call Shannon over at National Public Education Foundation and say, hey, let's work together on X, you know, because we both, we both know it's important, and let's pull in and like in Nashville, let's pull in whoever we need to pull in to make it happen. Um, so that's a value that we bring as an organization to this proposal. The fact that we really do work with lots of different groups um, and we have those relationships. We've been building our capacity, our entire existence, <laughs> but we've been really focused on it on the last four years. It's something that our board has committed to, the fact that we need to be able to do more because we're being asked by the community to do more. There's real value in what we bring, and we do it well. So let's figure out how we can do more of it and do it well. That is something that they work on, and it is working. We're also flexible. Um, we can adjust, because we're small, we're pretty nimble, that sort of thing. So now I want to get more into really the need and our part of the solution. We know that we have way too many children living in low-income families. We know that books are expensive. Um, we know that books are a luxury for low-income families most of the time, as far as owning them. We know that kids are out of school a whole lot more than they're in school, um, that we've got to catch them out of school, um, as well as in school. In school, they're learning how to read. Out of school, let's get them excited about learning how to read and wanting to do it and do it more often. Um, we know that there are not enough books in homes. There just aren't. Um, we have so many economically challenged families that just don't own books. It's great that they can borrow them. I and mean, we have this great library system, and we love working with the library system. And our community needs to continue investing in our libraries. But there's something really, really special about owning your own books and being able to pick them up anytime you want to pick them up um, and read them as a family. Um, and we know that, I mean, we hear over and over from teachers that we work with. You know, our kids wouldn't have books if they weren't for book owners. You know, they, they borrow from school library, but that's about it. Um, but we also know that the demand to give books to kids is immense. We can't meet all of the demand. So, we're coming to you in the hopes that you will help us meet part of that demand in a way that helps our community. Um, we know that it makes a difference. We're being asked to do more in the community we're being asked to give books to the Alignment Nashville Summer Reading Partners, to the pilot elementary schools with Literacy Collaborative, with um, the any pretty much anybody that works with low-income families that finds out about us, they're like, oh, we can have free books, you know? I'm like, yes, you can have free books as long as we have them. Um, we can do more because we're filling a lot of the gaps in the community already, but it takes money. It takes people and time and resources. We kind of figured out how to do it. And this is what it's going to take. What's what, it, what is in our proposal is what we think it's going to take. Um, we know that books and homes matter. They make a difference. We know that the kids want the books because they tell us they love their books. And part of what you get with us, too, is that you're going to be able to reach a lot more kids. We know that four books a child is not enough. We know that. But 2,500 kids now have 10,000 books. That's, that's important. That can, that can help. If we can do more, we will, believe me. We will, we will put as many books as we can out there. But we also want the community to help us decide what needs to be part of all this program. You know, what needs to be that literacy sheet 
What information about libraries needs to be on there? Um, how do we get it into Spanish and Arabic so that we can reach the families that need it? Um, time's up. Thank you for your time. Okay. Do you guys have questions to start? I'll let you start. One of the questions, would you go, Melissa? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so one of the concerns or questions I have is about the outcomes, yes. which I understand is it's a really tricky process for any of us. Right. Um, do you have a survey? Is it all the partners' responsibility to get that information? What we'll do is we'll actually develop a really simple survey that our partners will then use. Um, so they will be expected to complete the survey. When you say they? The, our contacts with our specific partners for this program only. So we already do surveys so with our partners. partners. the partners, okay. okay. The group's receiving the books. Okay. Yeah, the group's receiving the books will be responsible for completing the survey. We'll keep it simple, because we know everybody has too much to do as it is. Um, but we've got to make sure that we get the information we need. Okay. Um, so that will be part of the um, application process. And when we vet the groups that are actually going to be part of this specific proposal, that they have to agree to have a liaison with us, someone that we can contact and they can contact us, um, so that we can check in periodically, make sure that they're getting what they need, um, and if there's anything else we can do to help them, and making sure that they do complete the survey and give us the information that we need so that we can actually report back. And are you envisioning a paper survey, online survey, or do you have It's going to depend. Okay. It's going to depend on who our partners are and how tech savvy they are. I like online surveys. Mm -hmm. That would be my preference. Um, when we survey kids, which we do some of that as well, we do a paper survey with the little cute pictures, mm -hmm. so that even if they can't read well, they can say, yes, I like it a lot, because it's smiley face, that sort of thing. So we do have experience with the survey um, world, because we do it every year. Okay. In this survey, why is it new as opposed to using what you already use? Because we want to tailor it to this particular proposal. Um, we just want to make sure we're getting all of the information that we need. Um, we'll get more information than we need because it helps. Um, we ask questions, we ask the basic questions about, you know, tell me how many kids, how many books, and how, how is it beneficial, those sorts of things. But we also want to know how could it have been better? You know, that's a different question than meeting the outputs and the outcomes. That's about if we were to do this again, how do we how do we make it more efficient for you? How do we um, get you more of the books that you really need? How do we make it easier on you? All of those kinds of questions. Because we will take that information, we'll make improvements. And that's what we do every year. So we take the feedback from teachers and our volunteers, educators, our partners, and say, okay, is there anything that we can do with this? Is it a valid point? You know, that we're not doing this well on this piece, that we could, let's fix it. Or let's just change it because it is better. Things change too. Is the um, the ten thousand gonna be in addition to the ninety-six that you I mean what is the goal for you guys this year if you get the funding? Our goal for two thousand eighteen is a hundred thousand books. Okay. Out in the community. We did 90, over 96,000, almost 97,000. Our goal is 100,000 this year. Our goal in five years is to double that. Okay. Or less, hopefully. Okay. And and with your funding request, let's say you were not to get the full amount. Sure. That impact you're able to be able to deliver. Yeah. I mean, we would have to adjust the outputs and the outcomes accord based on the funding. I mean, if the funding is cut in half, our, our outcomes are probably going to be cut in half. I mean, we, <laughs> there's only so much we can do. 
and we're very efficient, um, but it still does take time and money because um, we're going to be purchasing a lot of these books, um, and it takes staff time to coordinate everything as well. But yeah, we, we understand. There's, you, know, you don't have a million dollars to give. So is the $9,000 for staff, current staff? Yes. And this would just be kind of their work for this particular project? Yes. Nobody in addition? Yes. Okay. Anything else? We're good on time? We're good. <laughs> okay. Anything else? <laughs> Uh, just uh, being involved with the organization, not just only as a reader, but as a board member, one of the things I found most appealing about booking was just the direct, tangible impact that we have on kids' lives. It's, it's just, we give brand new books to kids that need them. And when I go and do readings, it always amazes me what an impact it has on them. They immediately write their name in the book, put it in a locker. I mean, it's just, it's a treasure to them. Um, and that's just, that's missing from a lot of organizations, I feel. That, that I come across on a daily basis, just that immediate impact that you can see and touch and feel. It's just, it's such a rewarding proposal. What are some of the schools you visit? Uh, so I read at Caldwell Elementary in East Nashville. Mm -hmm. That's been my school since I started reading. So I mean, see familiar faces over the, over the years and they recognize you and you're the guy that brings free books. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte Park, mm -hmm. where I've been reading, and then uh, also for our Read Me Week, uh, Gower Elementary, um, also. But Charlotte has not been in my school for the last three or four years. Anything else? Good. Think we're good. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kim Karish, and I'm the CEO of the Nashville Adult Literacy Council. I did prepare a little agenda for us today, but essentially it's going to be following the outline of the proposals themselves, so I won't spend too much time on that, and we can dive into the content. I wanted to start with the proposal purpose. Um, the Nashville Adult Literacy Council, for those of you who might not know, we provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring and classroom instruction for adults who are learning to read, write, or speak English. And so I can imagine that you might have questions about why we are presenting a proposal for adults when uh, the focus of the, the CPF this year is on early childhood literacy. And my answer to that is that they go hand in hand with each other. And in fact, that um, children who are born to illiterate parents have a 72% chance that they themselves will score at the lowest literacy levels. And so what we're trying to do in changing the literacy levels for children is to do that by supporting the adults who are supporting them. And here's why. Um, you may have noticed, um, for those of you who have read all the way through the blueprint for early childhood success, there was a section in the introduction that dealt specifically with some research of the effectiveness of pre-K programs. And it was research done through the Vanderbilt Peabody Research Institute in 2015. And what they found is that the children were entering school with an advantage. They were coming in ahead. But by second grade, the children who did not go to a pre-K program were actually outperforming the students who did, which was a baffling finding. And their conclusion was that there had not been enough done to support the schools and the educators and also the families who were supporting those children. And then some additional research was done through developmental psychology. And this, this particular study was around math skills. But they found that 72% of the fade out effect was actually attributable not to the school system, but to environmental conditions. And those environmental conditions include things like motivation and family income. And I don't want you to mistake what I'm saying. The early childhood interventions absolutely must happen. There is critical brain development that's happening during that age, and, and it, it needs to happen the way it's being laid out in our city today. But the risk is that we could actually stand to lose our investment if we're not supporting those other programs that go along with it, including adult literacy. 
So in fact, in the blueprint for early childhood success, they mention parents, families, and generations more than 300 times. That is how direct the alignment is. And in Nashville, one in eight adults cannot read at a functional level. And 30% of our students in metro schools are living in homes where English is not the primary language. So our solution is to address that piece of the problem. And I'll talk for just a minute about what we do when we get to the Q&A. Feel free to ask me as many questions if I don't dive into as much detail as you'd like. Um, we offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We train volunteers to instruct and we'll actually match a single volunteer with a single student. Um, and that's, that's probably the thing that we do that's most unique in the city. We also offer some English classes. There we have certified ELL teachers and that's a setting in which I'm sure we're all familiar where there may be a group of students who are learning at the same time. We do have some high school equivalency programming. We primarily do that for students who don't thrive in a classroom setting. If we think someone can be successful in that, we're going to refer them to OIC or to Workforce Essentials, most primarily. And then we do have some independent computer programs and a computer lab where students can come study with us as well. We serve two different types of learners. There are proficient English speakers. These might be people who were born and raised here in the United States, but for one reason or another never learned how to read. And we also serve English language learners, and these are adults typically who have immigrated to the United States. And they run a wide spectrum of abilities. We're serving people who were illiterate in their home countries. We're serving people who are doctors in their home countries. And so what we try to do is give them the skills to work to the top of their license here in the United States. Last year, or in this current year, we're expecting to enroll about 1,000 learners this year. Again, we do that with the help of hundreds of volunteers. We have such a strong volunteer force in the city. All of our learners are required to be 18 years or older, and the vast majority of them earn less than 200% of the poverty level. And um, I should mention, we estimate that 50% of our learners are parents of school-aged children. That's something that we just started tracking this year. I'll speak a little bit about how we do it, but primarily through the lens of accessibility. We try to make our programming as accessible as possible, primarily by not charging anything for the services that, that we offer. I will say um, we did have a couple of classes this year that weren't fully funded, so we charged a $40 fee for registration. It was for an eight-week course, so still an extraordinary value for our students. Um, and then in addition, uh, related to accessibility, we operate in two locations. We have one near the Nations in West Nashville, and we have an additional office in Antioch where we see the need is extensive. Um, currently, right now, we have more than 150 students as of last week waiting for services and wanting services from the Nashville Adult Literacy Council. On, on our availability, our classes, we try to locate them in as many locations as we can around the city. And then the beauty of our one-on-one -on -one tutoring program is that once we have a pair matched and the tutor's trained and we've given them the individual learning plan, they can meet in any public location around the city. And that's how we overcome a lot of transportation battles. We'll try to match people based on geographic location. And finally, like, like you've heard other agencies, we partner with a number of other agencies because no one is doing this work in a vacuum. If this issue were easy to solve, we would have already solved it by now. And we recognize that through a number of partnerships. And then, as I mentioned before, we engage and train hundreds of volunteers. You do not need to be a professional teacher to volunteer for NALC. Patience and encouragement are the characteristics that we seek the most. I did prepare a slide about our budget specifically. We are making an ask for $50,000 through CPF. The vast majority of that is for salaries and benefits. And then we've got a small portion, about 7,000 for instructional materials and supplies. <coughs> that accounts for about 11% of our total program budget. Again, just focusing on the reading, writing, and English speaking skills. And I will say this funding is critically important to us. Two years ago, we received $89,500 through the CEF, 
And then, of course, last year, the amount of funding available from the city went from $2 million down to $1 million. And so that resulted in us getting 60% of our funding for this current fiscal year that we're in. That's 53700 And our ask at this point is for $50,000. The last thing that I wanted to mention in our time today was just around success measures and reporting. We're, we're measuring several things. We're measuring the number of people served. We're measuring the number of learners that get matched with a tutor as opposed to the number of learners through our classroom programs. We're measuring the number of learners that get an individualized learning plan. And um, that's important for a couple of reasons. Um, in terms of, of these success measures on whether we're doing standardized test results, which we try to measure everyone at least every six months to see if they're making any gains on standardized tests. But also as part of that individual learning plan will allow people to set personal goals. And what we recognize is that while we might have a goal for everybody to get a high school diploma, not all of our learners have that goal. Sometimes their goal is to be able to read well enough to pass the driver's exam so that they can get a driver's license, so that they can get that job that will give them a better income level. And then the final thing that I'll mention on our, on our measures is around school comfort surveys. We built a curriculum this year that is um, specific for parents and with children in Metro Nashville Public Schools. And so we're teaching that as part of our instruction and then through surveys measuring to see if they're getting more engaged in school activities. So I did, um, I know that we love our logic models, and so I did build out, um, it might be a little bit difficult to read, but I did bring, build out the measures. Um, essentially, we're talking about serving 200 adults um, and seeing gains or personal goal achievement in 60% um, of that total. And we can dive into more numbers on that as well. So I'll pause here. Um, and allow a little bit of extra time for, for questions. Well, questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, could you talk to me just about the um, the curriculum that you have developed for parents of students in Metro? Yeah, um, so we had a staff member go through, she actually went out and traveling to the school saying, what information are you giving to parents? We included things like homework hotline, um, we included information about camps and clubs and extracurricular activities, school schedules. We've got a whole section on schedules and being able to read a schedule. Um, we took some samples of school flyers. Um, we talked about the importance of attending and, and, and being a, a part of the, the child's um, life. So we just built out a little handbook. We tried to make it in really simple language and then um, instruct our tutors to help pass along that information. What's your percentage, generally, of those who have children in the household? I'm going to guess right now that it's about 50% of the people that we're serving that have school-aged children. Now, that doesn't count people who might have pre-K sure. aged. Um, we focus just at first. And this is a measure that we just started collecting this year. That's why I'm a little fuzzy on the numbers. This is kind of a baseline year for us to figure that out. And at the same time, we recognize that parents are the first interactors, the first educators for their children. And so, um, in fact, this year, we're, we, we've partnered with the Nashville Public Library, and we started our first family literacy program specifically for adults with preschool-aged children. And I was out there this morning, and um, the library was there, and they were reading books and um, demonstrating how to make stories out of everyday objects and, and turn that into storytelling. So money for this though, I, I think I read that you got a grant for that family literacy. We did. Yeah. Do we know okay. that the money, if we give you money for this, that you are seeing the parents? It's something that I can report back on at the end. Um, we haven't developed an intake process specifically. Um, however, I will say this, whether the adult is a parent or someone who interacts with children, a lot of times we're working with grandparents, and there are two main drivers um, that bring people to our program. One, people who want to get a better job, and two, people who want to support children or grandchildren. And we will frequently have grandparents come in and say, I just want to be able to read a book to my grandchild. And, and 
I know that, that is a part of their literacy story. And um, I'll have to share a story too. I was um, tutoring a student all year, and um, her English levels were very low. She had three school-aged children. And the first week, uh, we picked out a book for her to read to her five-year-old, because that was a similar level. And so the next week, I said, did Diego like his book? And she was like, yes. We did some translating, and she communicated. Her other two children were jealous. So this week, we needed three books. And uh, so we, we did that week after week after week. And then one day, it was, uh, it was around summertime. I think it was late spring, early summer. I said, do the children need books? And she said, no. And I said, no, why not? And she said, we came Monday. The family now goes to the library, and those children were reading all summer long. And that just really, that to me is a summer reading program. <laughs> and then now Londra reads to Diego, and they're reading to each other as kids, too. So it, it, it's really neat. That's great. That's great. Um, my other, or another question I have is, will this, um, or could this money help that waiting list? Um, this this is funding that we received today, and so it would be sustain. It would keep us from having a waiting list grow even more. Um, if okay. that makes sense. So it's kind of to sustain. Yeah. Okay. It is. What else do you have other stuff? And the money then is for current staff as well. Correct. Okay. All right, and then the pilot that you have now. Mm -hmm. So they're really, you don't, this is, it just started, right? Correct. Okay. We're in the midst of it right now. We got a grant from Dollar General, and it's just to run this short pilot, collect our learnings, and see if we can build more of a program out of it. But we definitely want to move that direction. There's so much evidence that supports multi-generational learning. And I should mention, too, um, with that pilot, in addition to partnering with the library, we also partnered with Vanderbilt Children's Pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And so we have residents coming out. We've got translators who are translating some medical information. Because as a nation, we spend $232 billion a year in health care because of literacy issues. And that's more than we spend on cancer care as a nation. Um, so it's an astounding statistic, and while we're teaching someone English, we want to be including some content that can help in other areas as well. So the outcomes mm -hmm. that we'll get, if funded, are kind of like those general areas that you have, so we'll be seeing just across the board. Perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. So much for that. All right. Community. Thank you. I really can't say enough good things about partnering with the library. Um, I've been in this space for two years, almost two years now myself, and um, the partnership has just been incredible. And really enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks for inviting us to um, present this our proposal on imagination library book notes. So as laid out in the, um, the blueprint the recommendations, foundation for this proposal, are the problem that we're responding to is the large number of national third graders who are not reading on grade level. And we plan to impact this by building community support for um, children's social emotional development and by providing community-based and culturally competent early childhood resources. Um, so, we know that literacy begins long before a child even enters the classroom. 90% um, of a child's brain development occurs in the first four years of life, as cited in the Blueprint for Recommendations. Uh, we also know that research has well established that um, cognitive, emotional, and social skills are inextricably intertwined throughout the life course, and so this social-emotional development is very critical to academic learning. Um, however, despite this knowledge, there is a lack of investment in early childhood resources, um, including financial resources and uh, resources for parent support. Um, and so our, so our solution is responding to Pillar 1, Tier 1 to strengthen birth through age 3 supports in the community by building upon networks that already exist. 
So what we want to do is create book nooks, which are social emotional lessons that teach social skills by pairing it with a um, children's book. And this originated from the Center on Social Emotional Foundations for Early Learning. And what it does is it teaches um, developmentally appropriate questions and activities and supports early literacy and social emotional development. And additionally, we want to um, engage the community in learning about social skills, why they're important, and how to teach them by holding events at Nashville Public Libraries um, for parents and care caregivers to attend, as well as other community members. So our target audience are the parents and caregivers of children birth to age five who are already engaged in the Imagination Library. However, they don't have to be enrolled in the Imagination Library to participate or to benefit from the events and materials. Um, so by targeting caregivers, we impact early literacy in a multifaceted manner, including meaningful engagement with books. We promote positive interaction and communications between the parent and child, which really build that social emotional development. Um, and we help the parents to support their children's social and emotional development in the home. These skills are transferable from different books. So using the Imagination Library book list, we create book nooks and at least two book nooks. So we had a total of 12 new book nooks created, two book nooks from each of the age groups. And half of the book nooks would be um, books that, have, that are bilingual or have Hispanic content. All of the book nooks that would be created would be translated into Spanish and Arabic to um, engage the growing diversity here in Nashville. And then the public events held at the library would rotate around the different Nashville um, public libraries. And we would focus on teaching parents, caregivers, and community members how to use book nooks. We would also incorporate other social emotional learning um, tools, such as positive solutions for families, which um, focuses on the parent and child relationship and promotes, which teaches emotional literacy. But the idea behind book nooks is that it's a framework and it's teaching skills. And so while it's focused on that early childhood book, it's really transferable to any other books. So we want to build that capacity across all different um, sectors. So these are the major actions of our proposed budget. Uh, the requested $50,000 fund salaries and benefits for one part-time employee. Uh, within the printing and publications uh, section, um, that includes book note materials, which includes um, a master book note copy for each branch of the library. Uh, within the professional fee and grants award section, we've included translation services for all of our materials. Uh, the other category includes things like transportation, equipment, postage for marketing materials, things like that. And then supplies include social emotional learning supplies uh, that we can use at events and to develop these materials. So to measure our impact, we would um, take sign-in sheets and satisfaction surveys at the events. But then looking more long-term, like three to six months after a family attends one of the events, we would follow up with a questionnaire asking about how often reading is happening in the home, um, any new social skills that that child is displaying, um, what the parent and child remember from that event, and then any, if any, other, what other supports are needed for in the home to build that social emotional awareness and capacity. Um, and we, our expected impact is that when we equipped uh, when we equip parents and children with pro-social skills, they learn how to self-regulate, how to solve problems, how to develop friendship skills and positive peer relationships. And we know that when kids have that, when they enter the classroom, they do better academically. So this is the organizational chart um, that shows TVC's uh, program organization. The Imagination Library Book Notes will be housed under the Early Childhood Program, uh, which is overseen by the clinical director who provides supervision for all of TVC's programs. Our Early Childhood Program has a long history of providing um, social and emotional um, trainings for teachers, for caregivers, for families. Um, and a lot of that does include uh, book note uh, materials. Um, yeah, and so this is the project block, uh, timeline. So when the early childhood specialist begins on July 1st, within one month, 
we would ask for a marketing plan outlining how to raise awareness in the community of these events and then kind of create a year-long calendar of when events will be held at what libraries, when book notes will be released. And then um, by the end of the grant year, we want each library to have a uh, master book note curriculum. Um, and that leads into our sustainability plan. So the partnership with the National Public Library is really um, vital to creating long-term sustainability because not only do we want to equip parents and um, caregivers with how to teach social skills and why they're important, we want those skills to also be transferred, transferred to library staff. So when that master book note curriculum is left there, there's somebody on staff who knows the value of the book note and how to point parents and caregivers to that as a resource and can also use that to increase, um, to add another tool to their toolbox for events that are already happen happening at the library. Um, additionally, we have a, Tennessee Voices for Children has a website and we would post and hold the master book note curriculum on our website, which parents, caregivers, and people in the community can access at no cost. Um, and because we want to build skills for social emotional learning and why it's important and how to teach it not only in early literacy but in all aspects of life, by teaching these skills we hope that it just continues because parents have the capacity and the competency to continue that. Um, and so with that, um, we'd like to just open it up for questions. I, I need some help visualizing some of this. So, well, first of all, the book nook, what does that look like? I have, this is an example of a book nook. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm thinking about the little electronic nook thing. Okay. <laughs> so, do the families, they leave with this? Or no? So, what we want to do is using, we want to create book nooks throughout the throughout the year, but by the end, that would be, we would compile all of them together, and that would be like the master book nook that would be left at the libraries. Families could also have that. It would be housed on the Tennessee Voices for Children's website as well. And so, in the library, I have two questions about that. First, what does it look like? And then when you said you're going to ask for a marketing plan, who's mar our marketing plan? The no, library? from our staff. From the staff member, just kind of planning out the entire year of when events would be held. So that would, like that first month, kind of talking with library staff on when events could be held, when book nooks will be like written out, so that we have a year-long plan. And this may help, but just that they had been the time on 30 days of planning them up before they started the implementation. So that's really what that 30-day window is for the staff member who would or organize the. The project. So ostensibly, you're working with somebody from one of the locations in the library, right, one of the branches, and getting an audience there, and you're kind of rolling this out, and is that the intervention? It's a one-time, am I understanding that right? The one-time intervention with the families at the event at the library? Um, yes, we plan to hold at least two events every month. So, at different libraries. But they're probably going to be different families. Mm -hmm. okay. so these materials will be made available to, you know, on our website, book mix posted on our website, potentially on the library's website or Governor's Books from Birth. Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to be accessible to a large number of people. And they'll have skills in them that are transferable beyond just that one book. Um, information right. about child development, social emotional development. Um, the events really enhance that learning. So this is currently going on? We do currently train on book books. Okay. What do the parents walk away with from a book milk session? So they would, what we hope they walk away with is ways to kind of not, not only just like read the book like front to back, but also like how we introduce the books to the kids. What so they receive the so actual? They would receive the actual book nook for that book. Okay. Um, and then any activities that would be done there, they would receive materials for that. Gotcha. But then there'd be the larger conversation about how we introduce books, how we critically ask questions throughout the book, and then how we can teach a social skill with that book. And have you evaluated? 
to, to clarify, this is not something that we currently are able to do um, under our contract with families. It's something that we incorporate into our trainings with early childhood caregivers, um, educators. And they have the book itself, or they may, they might, or they might not. So if they're in, if they're enrolled in the Imagination Library, then they would have the book. If they're not enrolled, then perhaps this would be a great avenue to get families involved in the Imagination Library. Um, but we could read the book at the event and do the activities, and it would still benefit um, even if they don't have. So Ron's question, so right now, there is no, this isn't actually happening the way you're proposing that it happens here. So, so the piece about trying to get the information from the families who have come, like if you send them three to six months, that you haven't done that. That hasn't been. I will say, um, at one point, this predates me, I've been with the organization as a CEO for four years, and so before that, there was an, um, a grant or awarded to the Target, and they did a similar type of thing with book nooks. Like you all remember Mamie McKenzie, mm -hmm. um, and she put together these book nooks in this way, matched with a book to teach book literacy and social emotional skills. And so we have a model for the book nook itself. Like they said, um, we just tar the Target grant didn't require any kind of evaluation, so it wasn't done. Okay. So right. this would be an opportunity for us to to go ahead and do that evaluation and and move it forward if it works really well. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. How many um, families do you anticipate serving at an event? And um, yeah, I guess that's my first question. Yeah. Um, and let me just add to that, how do you plan on getting them there? So how many people and how do you get them there? So we would look at posting um, flyers around the community and mailings to, like, because it'd be housed at a, at a library, we'd hope to kind of build upon families that are already attending events at the library that are already engaged in the library. Um, so we could do, but then we'd also want to grow that. So we could do um, early, we could do mailings to early childhood centers or schools. We also have um, the Family Connections Program at Tennessee Voices for Children that works with families in Davidson County. Um, that would be another way we could engage those parents that we're already working with in the home um, to come to the library and participate with that. And I'll add one more. Um, we would also, we have a partnership with Kids Central with Tennessee. Uh, are you guys familiar with that? Okay, so I won't give you background. Um, but you wide our contact there. Uh, we have to have to put, and we, we appreciate this, but for all of our grants, we have to include Kids Central information, and she's really great about including our information, likewise, on her website. So we've posted, in the past, we've made videos on development in early childhood, and she's posted those on Kids Central, and obviously there's thousands of families who use that website, so I think for us, approaching her would be easy, and I think she'd be very interested, as she's already demonstrated with prior early childhood initiatives with us. Do you have some target libraries that you're thinking about? Um, I would say um, probably looking at like uh, I mean d the downtown library would be one. We probably look at where the early child where there's already a network of early childhood. Um, programs to kind of build upon that um, and then making sure that we're spreading out to reach the different areas of Davidson County. Um, we also looked at, um, there's a map included in the blueprint of families engaged in the Imagination Library and so we could certainly um, include that in our consideration. I think that was yeah. the least, maybe. <laughs> What kind of support are you getting from United Way Imagination Library? We don't currently have any United Way. Okay. So when you say Imagination Library, you're going to get their rosters or? Well, we would, we would use their book list that I they have published saying. online. That's what we would use um, to create this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And let me just finish by saying.
saying that we um, we need to get our recommendations to the mayor's office um, by next week, and then then we decide. <laughs> okay, we give them our suggestions, and so it should happen. I guess it's going to be. Is it going to be voted on? I think the mayor's budget is due, so it's, with, it's included in the mayor's budget. I believe that's due like May first, yeah. uh, and then it gets voted on by the council in June. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, we watch a lot hours of Shark Tank to prepare for this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're so glad to be with y'all. I guess our first message is where you came to. We are going to be partners for you guys, regardless of whether you fund us or not. Um, we believe that we have a great, very strategic proposal that's going to support kids, going to support your, your strategic aims. But they align very closely with what we're doing as an organization. And we believe in public libraries and we believe in the impact that they have on our kids. So we're Communities and Schools of Tennessee. Um, we've been operating nationally for 40 years. We came out of Harlem, New York. Um, we've been operating in Tennessee for five years. We have schools in Memphis and Nashville. We have six schools currently in Nashville. We're very excited that we're part of the National Public Education Foundation's blueprint for early grades learning. Um, that's with the National Public Libraries and lots and lots of other partners, but the National Public Libraries and the National Public Educator, Education Foundation is the, the center for that. We address chronic absenteeism. Um, our work, the, the work of our site coordinators, are there to ensure that all of the barriers related to poverty are addressed so that students can come to school every day and to focus on learning. What that means is that we have a really dramatic impact on kids' lives. And I'll give you an example. We're at a new middle school next, uh, this year in Bellevue. And um, we had three gentlemen speak at an event that we had last week, each of whom, you, if I didn't meet them in a middle school, I would have thought that they were sophomores in college, extremely smart, very convincing in their arguments for the impact that our site coordinator had. Um, and each told intensely personal stories about how they thought about taking their own lives, how they faced very traumatic experiences at home, um, and how the site coordinator helped to address those and got them to school. But the real part of the story that I heard the day afterwards was what the students faced in the culture of the environment where they are and what a refuge the library is. So for example, the students were lined up to be ambassadors as, as our site um, visit visitors came into the school. Luckily, um, it wasn't one of our visitors, but a different family came in, and um, the husband saw the young gentleman lined up, um, ready to take visitors back, and he asked, what were they lined up for? A mugshot? And our students are often, um, we have very diverse schools in Nashville, which are great, but they face things that we can't ever, I, I can't imagine. And our site corners are there to work on um, the environment around the kids, but, on, but then also the culture of the school. In that particular case, the library and the librarian was a refuge for that school. It was a place where um, the students were able to go they were able through the National Public Library's um, uh, loan program, find very diverse books that spoke to their passion and helped to build that culture in the school um, that, that encouraged them that their school was a welcome place that they wanted to come to all the time. So let's get into the details. Um, we uh, are in schools every day with a full-time cycle. And so one of the themes that you'll see from this work is that we're the best delivery mechanism. So as you think about the aims of the National Public Library, you know, y'all know how to get books to kids. What we hope to do is help get the kids to school, connected to the education, able to focus on learning so that they are able to receive and take advantage of the resources all already available to them. Allison's going to talk a little bit. Allison is our program director. I'm the statewide CEO. And Allison's going to talk a little bit about what our site coordinators actually do in schools. So our site coordinators um, are there in our schools to provide school-wide services um, that are all focused around chronic absenteeism and building a positive school-wide culture. And then they also case manage 10% of the student body, students with the highest needs. 
And with those students, they provide um, small group um, services, which might be um, like communication team building skills or group mentoring programs. And then they also provide level three um, individual services for students with the highest needs. So they're working with those students who might have chronic health issues, students who have um, particular resource needs, and their families as well. Um, and so just to kind of walk you through what all these different services can look like, our site coordinators are often the ones planning the family engagement events, um, something like a literacy night or a STEM night. Uh, they often do connect with the library and those resources to bring library services into schools. And then with their case managed students, um, they are uh, just really working with them one-on-one -on -one to set goals on how to be in school and provide those enrichment and motivation opportunities for those individual students. So as Hank mentioned earlier, the library or books play a big role in that uh, because often our books and diverse texts are one ways that our students find um, commonality with characters that are like them. Um, a shared story with somebody who isn't them and help find language to build their own story and talk about their own journey in that school. Um, those services are provided after an extensive needs assessment that our site coordinator does at the beginning of the year. So there's a lot of research and there's a lot of planning with our school leaders. So our services are never delivered in a silo. They are delivered um, in really close collaboration um, with that school. So as we think about um, our results, we are a very <clears throat> data-centered organization. It is ingrained in our day-to-day -day operations. On the front end of the school year, we set clear goals, uh, we do a needs assessment, and then we determine what, based on that data, needs to be done over the course of the school year, and then track towards that progress. So we're proud of our results. Uh, we um, have uh, about 90% improved behavior outcomes. You can see the others on there, academic gains, and 96% of kids stay in school. Um, we'd be happy to end questions, talk more about those. So heading into the blueprint. Uh, we are very thrilled to announce that um, the school district um, is helping to double down on this uh, blueprint work where we are as a tactic to help to uh, increase middle grades literacy in elementary schools and we're going to be going into 18 additional elementary schools this next year. Um, we're going to be serving students um, from high poverty, low performing, high chronic absentee schools. Five of those schools um, are in the National Public Education Foundation, National Public Libraries blueprint. Um, it's part of the pilot schools that they that they talked about there. So that is what our proposal is for, is to help to support that work. Um, and in addition to Caldwell, which we're all already serving. Um, matters a lot. Um, Y'all know the data well, especially the statistic, that a third of their graders aren't being really upgradable. For um, students who are chronically absent, which means they miss at least 10% of the school year, the number is unbelievable. The number is um, that only 1.5% of them are being upgradable. So when you look at third graders, put in hard numbers, there are 815 third graders who are chronically absent, 12 of them are being upgradable. So that's the, that's the part that we really try to address. Um, Allison has talked a good bit about our intervention. We'll be happy to answer more questions about that. Um, these are the schools that we're talking about. Uh, Glen Mary in particular has a high Yale population, which is really important, making sure that we connect students there. So we're happy to talk more in the questions about um, what we hope to achieve as part of this grant, um, but we are committed to ensuring, as Allison is talking about, that students are really connected in the libraries. We're interested in looking beyond just these schools as well to think about how libraries are working together. Um, so we'll be glad to talk through these outputs and go back to them. And then the outcomes. Um, so again, our top on measure is the chronic absenteeism, um, but then we also want to talk about how, feel, how connected they feel to the library environment. Um, and as Allison talked about too, it's really important 
And one of the benefits of CIS is that we go to even families where they are, and oftentimes they've had um, not great experiences recently in their own school environments. And so we love to go meet them, and in a few of our schools we picked up um, the parent-teacher conferences and moved them to a public gathering space. Um, so far that hasn't been a library, but I think that that might be an interesting collaboration opportunity as well. You're at 10 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody to start more? Um, let me bring some online questions. So the 96% that stayed in school, are we talking about for that school year? Yeah. We're not talking about graduation or anything? No, because um, our, we're five years old, our first graduating class in high school will be graduating this year. Do you track that? Do we track who stays on and graduating? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as we're particularly thinking about elementary schools, obviously that's... That's a whole lot of traffic. It's, it's over a long time period. period but, yeah. Um, but yeah, we're very interested in that. We're also um, entering a lot of data projects to figure out what other correlations are there and what we can look into more on that. So, so um, when you're out of school and you're in the elementary school, right, and do you see the same kids year after year? Uh, we can. We do that, or we try and keep students on our caseloads as long as they need to be. Sometimes we find that a student can roll off because they have gotten to a better place, their family is more supportive, and there's another student who might has more needs that needs to come on. But we do believe in building that um, sustainable relationship with, with students so they have multi years of support. And to put it uh, to go a little bit deeper on that question, we're also in. Um, and one pathway currently, and we're looking at expanding that in future years, but we're in a middle school that feeds into a high school, mm -hmm. and we'll work with a family that has students across that pathway as well. Mm -hmm. And so not only is that one to year, but that's multi-kids within the same family to help address their issues. Okay. I think if you ask it or somebody can just How many children do you typically serve in a school? Do you have an yeah. average of children? So there's two ways to measure that. One is the whole school services that we provide, and that's just a school population. Mm -hmm. um, but then we serve 10, we case manage 10% of the kids, up to 50, because of course we want our set coordinators to be effective in that raise more case. But, so if it's a, particularly in elementary schools, you know, we'll, we'll have some schools that are 230 kids, um, you know, that we're rarely bumping against that 50. And then the um, improvements in behavior, is that indicated by the school discipline numbers? It's by suspensions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you get that from the schools and also the academic gains. So everything you're doing is in the warehouse, the data warehouse in the Correct. Car. You can do it by individual student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, what else? If you didn't get the full amount, how would that impact? your ability to proceed. We are very committed to this work, and we are working um, to develop very diverse learning streams. And so, you know, again, we're committed to kids regardless, and this will just help us ensure that we're able to get there. Um, but we're going to be in this school regardless. It just will have to work even harder to find it from other sources. I guess what I mean, but um, we we want to be in a place where we have years worth of commitment to kids, and so if we were to win this grant, it'll help to uh, fund, and then as we find additional money, it'll help to go to future years for that. And the fifty thousand supports one particular. The yes, the fifty thousand. <coughs> no, um, we're proposing that that be spread across uh, four different schools. Okay. For the site coordinators? Yes. But it's and it's four different site coordinators. Right. Yeah. So there's a part in the application, so it looks like you're trying to encourage them to use limitless libraries. Am I reading that right? It says we aim for these students to access and borrow at least five books each school year from the National Public Libraries and Limitless Libraries to encourage reading and growth of vocabulary and literacy skills. Mm -hmm. Um, do you do that currently? 
We, we do. We are not necessarily tracking that okay. that checkout rate right now, but that is, as Hank talked about, I talked about, that is something that we promote as part of our services. Okay. Yeah. And related to an earlier question, so are you already in these five schools? Or one out of, okay. one out of, uh, well, uh, so it's four schools in this grant. Okay. Uh, it's confusing. There's a lot of different dynamics going on. Um, we're in Caldwell for the grant, and then three new ones for this grant. How many have you served by Caldwell? How many students have you served? Mm -hmm. We've. It's 230 total at the school, K through four, and we case manage about 25 students there right now. And we've been there for three years. Um, we follow that principle. It used to be at Ross, which mm -hmm. closed down. So that's one full-time site coordinator, 25 kids at Caldwell. Mm -hmm. In addition to whole school level work. So like I talked about with those kids at middle school, um, a lot, you know, there's, uh, Black History Month, we do a lot around family engagement, which applies to whole school. Um, and so there's three different components of our work, and so that 25 is what you're talking about with the, with the site court, uh, with the case management. So the outcomes with families mm -hmm. that you currently track? That, um, it depends, but for this grant would be school level. Um, so, in a call ball just to maybe mm -hmm. some talk around numbers. We would be looking to uh, increase efficacy among all t families of 230 students because we do that school-wide family engagement work. So at Caldwell, our site coordinator runs the family newsletter. She runs um, family um, like advocacy events. She does the monthly or um, quarterly family fun events. So she does STEM night, literacy night. Um, and are you tracking the outcomes from those families currently? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. And it has to do with support and knowledge and... What right. So right now what we're measuring is how, um, how much families feel like information they're getting from their school and how the school is responding to their concerns. And we track that through a survey that we've created as part of our organization based on data from CIS National. Um, but the excellent part about our model and what we could do at the beginning of the year with the survey is add or adapt that language to include something about library services because it would already be going out to families. Yeah, that's a point that I did not know school in presentation. You know, our connection is to students and we look at their outcomes, but we're working with families right. just as much as kids. And so it's a conduit through the school and through us to be able to reach families as well. So I'm just curious, so if you're talking to them and asking them if they're getting the information from the school, and let's pretend they're not, then you're in the position to talk to the yeah. school folks and hope that there's a change. Not just hope. I mean, I think that's a, that's a key part. We develop really close relationships with our families where they trust us. Right. But then equally important is we develop a really trusting relationship because we're in the school every day mm -hmm. um, with the school administration. And so we're oftentimes advocates for the families. So, for example, we'll give out a couple again since it's part of this. You know, there's a large Tanzanian population there. Now, I, I didn't know that before this work. And so those families did not feel connected because of the language barrier. And a lot of what, what are, um, you know, what they've been advocating for more language services and more opportunities for the families to get involved in that. And now they're very involved. They feel connected to the school. Well, and on top of that, they do a special monthly parent meeting for just those Swahili speaking families where they come in with interpreters and cover things like what's what sort of community resources out there? When do I need to refile for my 10 care? Um, what sort of at home at learning activities can I do with my student, um, even though I'm not an English speaking parent? And oftentimes the principals know that this is an issue. It's a lack of human power to be able to actually accomplish those goals. And are they, you know, like Glenn Gary and Glenn, I can't remember the others, yeah. kind of like, is it the principal buy-in? Is that how you get into those schools, or? So it's it's a couple of things. Um, one is the data driving which schools we should be thinking about, mm -hmm. and then we're talking with the principals to see if this is a part of um, her or his strategy. Um, and then, but that is extremely. They have important. to have buy-in, right? Yeah. Okay. And so with them, we we've been uh, through the 
uh, the National Public Education Fund actually talked with these principals for almost all of the year. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? No, we've been on time. We've got we 10 seconds left. <laughs> 40 seconds. <laughs> well, again, we're here regardless. Yeah. We love you guys' support. Um, I, I think this is an exciting way to further develop that and um, help you be able to reach families um, and uh, give us a, another great tool that we can help families as well. But thank you for this time. Okay. Um, we will be finished at the end of the week. We make our recommendations to Metro. They vote on the budget at the end of June. And, and it's really after our suggestions. It's in their hands. Yeah. Their ropes, but, okay. So cool. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good you to see too. you. You too. Thanks for what you do. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Well, hi everybody, I'm Courtney Morgan and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Libraries Bringing Books to Life program. We uh, are, what last slide, um, we were developed in 2003 um, and we are an early literacy outreach initiative um, that goes out into the community to provide story times, parent and child and parent only workshops, curriculum materials to schools, the puppet truck visits, and also teacher trainings um, around early literacy topics. So we go to any child care center or elementary school in Davidson County that requests a visit. We're a program of partnership, so our initial partnership um, with schools takes about six weeks between teacher trainings, um, story time visits, and the puppet truck visit, as well as a family literacy celebration that happens typically at a library. So we talk about early literacy and whole child development. Um, with teachers, we take the time to um, incorporate literacy-based curriculum into a workshop for them. And then after they've gone through that process and had time to play, or be with the materials, we then provide them with a story time that models um, appropriate storytelling techniques around that literacy theme that they've seen, which is based on what the puppet show is going to be about. Then they get a visit from the puppet show about a week later, and then we finish it off with a huge celebration with family so that they get to visit the library and see how well the library can come to them. They can also come to the library and take advantage of those resources. So, where does Bringing Books to Life fit into the blueprint um, that is out right now? And really, the answer is largely in the birth to three supports. Um, for the purposes of this grant, we are focusing on Head Start and Metro families. And NPS families, um, largely due to the residency requirements, um, but also these are some of the most vulnerable populations that we're going to see. We've got over 20 languages spoken in NPS schools. We've got Title I schools, I believe over 80 in the system, meaning that 50 to 75 percent of those kids are living below the poverty line. Head Start families, the requirements for attendance are either through um, meeting federal income guidelines or through having a diagnosed disability um, and an IEP in place. So really working with these organizations uh, provides us a rich opportunity to meet the families and the children and the teachers that need us the most. Uh, in addition to that, we're also looking at grade level reading supports. Bringing Books to Life has recently expanded into K through 3 through our parent workshops. We have two new parent workshops. Um, one is about early reading motivation, um, and the other one about reading comprehension. So we're starting to move beyond the basics of play and literacy and um, having a good story time and what that looks like in positive interactions with books and into comprehension and more advanced topics. Um, and also we're encouraging the use of library services. So when we go to workshops, we offer library card signups. Get closer to summer challenge. We provide information about summer challenge, which also fits in with the summer slide component of, or summer reading loss component of the blueprint as well. Um, and who we're serving? So last year, that was about 1,800 guardians and children in our loving and learning workshops, and then another over 12,000 students in story time. Um, that's not including our puppet truck visits as well, which don't necessarily, which would add more to that number. And what we're anticipating going forward, and specifically in regards to Metro Public Schools and Head Start, um, we're looking at about 770 guardians 
um, and children at parent workshops, and then we're also looking at another 2,600 story time participants and teacher training with, uh, participants. These numbers are based on percentages. We ran our overall percentages from 16, 17 as to how many workshops and teacher trainings and story time visits were made to Metro and Head Start schools, and that's how we arrived at these numbers. How do we know that we're being successful and uh, bringing this to life has a lot of quantitative and qualitative measures in place. We have surveys for every type of service that we offer. So we have puppet truck surveys, we have initial and follow-up surveys to parents, we have annual surveys to our partner sites, um, and we also have teacher training surveys to get feedback directly about our teacher trainings um, that are independent of any of our other programming. We also, um, when we have a new partner site, after that six week um, time that they have with us, we have someone go interview the students um, to see about their narrative retelling skills. This is really our only touch point that is based directly on student outcomes. Most of our work measures um, adult behavior, so teachers or children, or teachers or parents, and how our services affect them and how that affects, or affects their interactions with their children. Um, we only get a couple of direct touch points with children per year, so our model really relies more on um, working with teachers and parents for a more sustained impact. Um, we also track our participant numbers and our supply numbers throughout the year, so we know what we're using and how much of that we're using. Um, and then also we have a logic model where we consolidate all of this information. And I was looking and trying to think of a qualitative, um, or a quote that met kind of to encompass all of this, and this is actually from Jamie Claybrooks at Mount View Elementary, she's their librarian and media specialist. Um, she said, I can say on behalf of 40 plus teachers at our school and our 700 student body, thank you to BBTL for six years of services. Um, that you provide, the lives you touch, and the relationships that you build. Because of this program, many of our families now see the public library as a family resource learning center. Um, and I really thought that that encompassed A, us going to the school, but B, how this library is seen by those people um, and by the teachers that are there every day. And the results. So <laughs> at the end of the day, one of my favorite questions to ask is, so what? What does all this mean? Um, and what it means is that 95% of our teachers are reporting an increase in literacy-based curriculum in their, in their classrooms. They're also reporting, 98% of them are reporting that they're continuing to use our materials year after year. Um, and then also 92% of teachers are reporting that children are using books in their classroom centers. Um, in terms of our parent workshops, 99% of our parents um, report learning more about their children's literacy development after our workshops. And last year, 100% of our parents, uh, in course, it, 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 ooh, 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 got time time. 100% of our parents reported or reported an increase in their literacy-based activities at home. Um, and 88% of our sites that we surveyed requested follow-up services. Um, from one year to the next. So really, it, I mean, it's a testament to our lasting impact in the community. How, would we, how does that affect the blueprint and what we're measuring for the purposes of this grant? Um, we've taken some of our outputs and outcomes that are in our logic model and adapted them for Metro and Head Start families. So our first output being that we project serving 770 individuals, meaning parents and gu or guardians and children, um, with our loving and learning workshops. And output two being that we project um, providing either teacher trainings or story times to 2,600 individuals in Metro Head Start programs, which would be ch children and teachers. What we believe to be the outcomes of that is we project that 75%, at least 75% of parents and guardians participating in our loving and learning workshops will report learning more about their children's literacy development. 75% um, of parents and guardians participating will also uh, report being more likely to use the library as a resource, and then output three being that 60% of teachers surveyed will report using the library as a resource in their school. And our ask. So our overall ask is $46,347 to support our curriculum, story times, um, 
and materials and teacher trainings for teachers, as well as our literacy workshops for families in the Metro and Head Start programs. So what this looks like is $23,756 for wages, um, and that is broken down by position. Um, and that is based off of going over and looking at our overall programming and figuring out the percentages of time that people or different people within the department are dedicating to Metro and Head Start. Um, in addition, the benefits and taxes that go with that being $7,771. And then lastly, supplies being at $18,000 or $14,820, which is for our curriculum kits as well as our loving and learning kits. And that is the end of my presentation, so thank you for your time. I'm super excited to answer any questions I can. Um, can, you, can you kind of speak to us about um, when you said the kits? Yes. What's involved in a kit? <laughs> so many things. Okay, so our loving and learning kits, um, they have materials for parents and for children in them. So for parents, there's information such as uh, informational brochure, that's the word I'm looking for, about the five things that they can do every day with their kid, which is read, write, sing, talk, and play, um, which is provided by the American Library Association. So we have those pamphlets available to them. We have early literacy calendars available to them uh, with recommendations of something to do every day for infants and for preschoolers. Um, in addition to that, we also provide a copy of the library's Unbound, which has information about all of the programming at all of the branches. Um, so that they can find a library event near them. We have a sign up for Dolly Parton's Imagination Library included in there. Um, and then we get to the fun stuff for kids. Um, so we have scrapbook paper of varying sizes for them to experiment with. They get crayons, scissors, wiki sticks, which are like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> and they also get a uh, pencil and scissors that will cut hair. Heads up. <laughs> we have to receive one of these. Um, so they get those things as well as stickers, alphabet stickers, um, which is a very popular item. Um, and then depending on the workshop that they see, they get something that is particular to that workshop. So if it's our read aloud workshop, they get a nursery rhyme CD. If it's our play workshop, they get Play-Doh. If it's our writing workshop, they get a chalkboard of chalk. Um, so it varies depending on the type of workshop. And then our curriculum uh, packets, which go to our partner sites prior to their Puppet Train Storytime visit, they get a curriculum packet full of ideas for the classroom based around the themes within the story that they're going to see. So right now it's Nazi the Spider, so they get things about bugs. Yeah, a Nazi is it, right? <laughs> so they get things about bugs, and they get things about storytelling and folk tales and tricky uh, or tricksters. So they get all of those ideas, which are developed by our curriculum coordinator in conjunction with um, educators that provide their ideas um, throughout the time that we work with them. They also get an activity to do as a classroom. So right now, that is a giant hula hoop and yarn so that they can build their own Anansi web. Um, and they also get a CD with all of the songs that are going to be in the puppet show so that they have the opportunity to hear that in advance. They also get a copy of the book. Um, Pretty sure that's it. <laughs> so they get all of that as well. And then we actually have a kindergarten specific one this year too, which lines up with the developmental standards um, with Common Core. And then they also get a different activity, um, which is a Nazi and the Moss Covered Rock. So they get a rock that they can build and a spider hat to make. And then um, a rock out of a fry basket, which is kind of brilliant, and some tissue paper. But they get that as well as a copy of Anansi Does the Impossible, which is the puppet show, and a copy of Anansi and the Moss Covered Rock. So they get all of that. Wow. What's the dream? To take over the world. <laughs> the really literacy world. The dream is to extend as far as we can to reach mothers that are expecting and to reach kids going into third grade so that we have this continuum of solid practice over time. Because I think the thing that we're finding, there was a manual study a couple years ago that upset some people about Head Start and how the kids weren't necessarily making games afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that it ends at Head Start. 
you know, they go into elementary school and they're not receiving the same it's intensity of services. And when we have the ability, I mean, I think it's more of a relevant thing here now that schools are stepping up and they're providing these extra services as well. But we have the ability to be with kids from infancy to they're in third grade. I mean, to have that continuum of practice and make sure that we can provide some influence over the quality of practice and that we can provide them with positive experiences of, with books for, gosh, eight years? <laughs> like, how fantastic is that? So the dream is to provide as many and as rich of experiences with books and with the library as we can. Because um, hopefully, I mean, we want to be a hub of the community, and I think that the Nashville Public Library is a shining example of what that can be. So I cannot wait to see what comes next. Um, but that's the dream. And most immediately, these funds, though, are going yes. to be used to sustain. Yes, to sustain and be more intensive in the K through three start. department. That mm -hmm. is. Yes. Mm -hmm. I noticed the percentage, 88%, are saying, please, we want repeated services. Absolutely. Tell me about the other 12%. Who are they? Who are they? Um, some of them are schools that have unfortunately fallen on harder times and aren't necessarily either um, maybe a child care center that closed down. And sometimes, I mean, it's it's something as simple as somebody turnover means that somebody forgot about us and doesn't know that we come and visit, and so they haven't called us back. But you're not charging. No. no, but it just that maybe the media specialist left because we know turnover is high in education okay. and no one told the new person that we exist. Um, so we actually have made efforts. We've gone back and looked at where we've sent surveys and where we haven't. Um, and we've reconnected with some of those schools. We also have a couple of schools that are on our list to call back. Um, and then we also go through this is a fun activity if you ever want to really enjoy the DHS website. We go through and we look and see what schools we're not serving in every zip code. Um, and I personally have sent mailers um, to several schools that we hadn't seen. Um, so we, we send information that way as well. So we're trying to reach that 12% and beyond. Awesome. I, just a thought is, um, have you been able to, or do you have a contact within Metro, I was thinking about this, that when they have their beginning of the year, um, you know, teacher meetings and schools are beginning, you know, um, have y'all thought, it just, it just occurred to me that that might be a way to reach people? I hadn't, I mean, we typically go to the kindergarten readiness fair, um, but we are in the teacher world, yes. the, 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 yeah. the elementary world. But that might be just with alignment and everything else. I mean, it seems like a, a great idea. Thank you. Or principal needs. Yes. Also a good place to be. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you, Gordon. Thank you. Thanks. Good. You have three minutes to spare. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for having us today. I'm Benjamin Schumacher. I'm Teacher for America and Nashville's Executive Director. Um, this is going to be a couple of things. Uh, we're really delighted and honored to be able to spend some time with you. Um, and this picture actually encapsulates our seven counties four years ago. This was my classroom uh, in the program that we're about to present to you. Uh, this was my co teacher, Stephanie Samuel. Uh, those kids are going to eighth grade now, it's crazy. <laughs> um, this was on the agenda. We'll talk to you a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve, which I know we should inquire around summer, uh, summer learning loss. Uh, we'll uh, talk to you about the specifics of the uh, solution we're proposing, and then some of the ins and outs, the impact, uh, how it works, and uh, the financials that undergird it all. So um, just to frame a little bit, we we're familiar with a lot of the facts related to summer learning loss. Um, we know that kids, uh, especially from lower income backgrounds, suffer the most, um, and that it's compounding, it's cumulative, that uh, it's, the, uh, it's the worst ability to get and the more opportunity you have to suffer from that learning loss. For us, Teacher America, and for many around the city, many of our great partners, we see it as a massive issue of equity for the city. Um, so not just about the summer, it's, it's truly about fulfilling dreams uh, for kids, uh, or deferred dreams in the case of too many of our kids. And so, um, one of our primary ways that we partner with the city over the last four years is, is, is this program. So I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about the details on it today. Um, here is, in a, in a nutshell, the highest level. So um, the program is a large summer school program. 
Um, overall, we actually serve uh, typically about 500 kids. Uh, we're proposing in, in this funding request to help us serve 150 first through third graders. Um, those 150 first through third graders will get about 60 hours of rigorous literacy, literacy instruction, which may all kind of give you the details on how it looks in a moment. Um, importantly, uh, we try to select uh, students that need the programming the most. And so for the last several years, we've partnered with NPS, um, uh, their, their counselors, their school leaders, their central office, uh, to get the word out to students who can benefit most from the program. This could be students who are behind in their learning. It could be ELL students. Um, and so we try, we try to find folks that will benefit most and that need it the most. Uh, and then we give it all to them for free. Um, transportation, breakfast, lunch. Uh, last year we even partnered with Boys and Girls Club to make it a full day of programming. Um, and we, uh, we give it uh, for free uh, to students uh, to take the burden off families uh, because uh, very often, as you know, it's the families that are uh, coming from lower income backgrounds that need the programming the most. <coughs> Uh, and then the last kind of framing point is that uh, we're really proud of how embedded this is. This isn't a standalone program. Uh, we actually totally couldn't pull it off without, the, without uh, the contributions of many different partners. We listed a few of them, um, uh, partners of higher learning, so uh, Vanderbilt and Lipscomb Relay, um, to Boys and Girls Club, that aforementioned, um, to some new partnerships that we have forming um, upcoming this summer, like PASA and others, to help us pull this thing off. And, uh, one of the results we're most proud of is that we actually totally reverse summer learning loss in this program. So uh, the data that Meg will go through um, shows us that instead of losing two months of learning, our students over a five-week period actually uh, tend to gain uh, two or more months equivalent of, of reading growth um, so for, a, for a net uh, gain of four, four plus months, which we think is uh, gives people a great, great head start going into the next year. In terms of grant language outputs and outcomes, um, I mentioned the top two outputs, 150 students at no cost and 60 hours of instruction. Another feature I would highlight that I think is kind of the fuel behind a lot of the outcomes we get is a really, really strong student to teacher ratio. If you were to walk into a classroom, uh, you wouldn't see one teacher kind of standing in the living room. You'd see lots of one-on-ones. You'd see a small group instruction, uh, and that's because we frankly pour a lot of money uh, into um, having a really high and a really strong ratio because we all know that if there's any magical and there's not, it would be through really uh, focused instruction with individual kids and small groups. Uh, and then outcomes we propose, I mentioned the two plus months of reading growth. Um, I will talk about measurement of that in a moment. Um, we also benchmark along the way formative um, and summative, our summative assessment we want all kids to hit 85%, that would be sort of the equivalent of an A in their summative assessment. Uh, and then finally, I really just wanted to hit on the last ripple effect of this, which is while we're totally focused on 150 kids in this program, all the teachers that get trained get trained in high quality literacy instruction, and they go out and affect thousands of kids, which then subsequently curb some of learning need um, after, after uh, working with full time kids. I'll talk to Renee and talk more about the program. Yeah, so as Ben mentioned, we really try to get the highest needs students um, in the district. And so we partner with school counselors and principals. Um, and especially at schools that are in the bottom 5% of performance across the state. Um, and so a lot of our students are behind on uh, reading level, on grade level in general, uh, and a lot of them won't get promoted to the next grade unless they come to summer school and do well at summer school. Um, about 75% of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. About 85% are students of color. Um, about 30% are English language learners. And amazingly, about 50, actually over 50 schools are typically represented. Um, ben didn't mention this earlier, but there actually was no MMPS summer school before we partnered with MMPS. And so I think that's why so many kids come. It's like a real, a real need. Um, and I'll flip forward a little bit here. I, there's some extra detail that you can read through but for visual learners, but I'll just talk through it. So um, this program takes about nine months to, to plan and execute. Um, we spend the fall recruiting our teachers, um, planning what the day is gonna look like, working with our school partners um, to start enrolling kids. That starts in about the winter, and then we train a staff of about 40. Um, uh, throughout the spring and work on our uh, curriculum that we'll be using with students as well. And then summer is all about execution. 
um, of summer school. And I'll talk a little bit about what that day looks like in summer school. So as Ben mentioned, we really focus on a small student to teacher ratio. It's about five to one. Um, and when you walk in, you'll see a lot of small group learning happening. Um, we group students by reading level, and we really focus on having instruction and have, having reading experiences at the reading level and then one reading level above, so that hopefully by the end of summer, the goal is to get them to grow one more reading level. Um, we found that that's been really effective. So at any given time, there's two to four teachers in the classroom. Um, and we really uh, are very data-driven in the program, so we do pre and post assessments um, and then we also use, typically we use the DRA to measure reading growth. Um, and more than that, we focus on like the daily level as well. So who we're obsessed with, you know, what students learn the content, what students didn't learn the content, what does that mean for you tomorrow when you go back and see your kids? Um, and a lot of the staff members that we hire and train are integral in, in that coaching process. Um, and then, like Ben mentioned, it wouldn't be possible with all of our partners. Um, we're really excited. This year we are pursuing partnerships with the library. We are um, going to be opening up our the school libraries, um, and then we're hoping to implement limitless libraries. Um, and then the Bringing Books to Life program at the elementary site for the first time, which we think the kids would really get excited about. Um, last year we were able to partner with Scholastic, and kids got to bring home one book per week. And we made sure it was high interest books. Um, culturally relevant text so that kids could see themselves like really represented in the uh, in the reading. Um, and I've, I've mentioned the staff members that we uh, work with and um, the school director at the elementary site is one of the most critical staff members. Um, they are experienced elementary educators who have a track record of success. Um, they're usually on the the, the um, in graduate school to become an assistant principal or are already assistant principals so they're really high quality folks. Um, and then we hire content specialists who are elementary education experts, and they are the ones who lead daily training with all the teachers in the afternoons, and they pull data across, you know, first grade or second grade um, to see, you know, what trends we need to address. And then we have instructional coaches who lead small groups um, to do those daily coaching meetings. That's my opinion. Cool. I'll just sit for one minute on the financials, and then if there are follow-ups on the numbers, feel free to dig deeper. Our request is for $50,000, um, which would be a big chunk of what you have available, I guess we get. <laughs> um, but mostly, it, you know, it turns out that educators don't like to work for free, so we're asking mostly for salary and benefits coverage. So about 70% of it's going to cover payment for, um, for personnel and talent, essentially. Uh, we also have 15 k reserved in request for uh, printing, um, learning, and curricular materials that are associated with uh, this volume as well. And the last point I'll make in the um, last 20 seconds here or so is just around the sustainability of the program. That was a question in the agreement. Um, and we, we intend to do this program as best we can, no matter what we've done for four years. It's a core part of our model. Um, the reason we ask for the DAWs is because the more we have, the more students we can serve. It's pretty plain and simple there. Um, every year we have a diversified base that helps fund it, including OPS itself, but um, it's a slog. Every single year we're out there beating, up, beating the pavement for uh, support for this program. Uh, and so this, the elementary component of this is about a quarter, so the 50 would cover about 50. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to know, so you've been doing it for four years here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Do you have kids come back in the same families? Do you know the percentage of families? Or? I don't know the percentage of families, mainly because um, NNPS switches the school site pretty much every year. So we work with them and they take, they look at who, um, principals have more autonomy now to, to build their own summer programs. And so they really try to make sure we're not overlapping that. And so sometimes if families don't come back, it might be because the school site has changed. Because the school, the school location changes. And we found that a lot of our families really rely on the free transportation. Um, okay. I'm just kind of confused. Okay, so all of the camps take place at a school. Yes. Okay, a number of different schools. And so sometimes those are the locations that change? Yes. Okay. There's a slide here that has the like, nine or so locations on the bottom, eight right. locations that we've had over the last four years, and the district helps make, they can make those decisions on what they want. Yeah. And so okay. a lot of times it's families that live in and around that neighborhood. So is there any um, 
Is there any advocacy on the side of the families if they want their kids to return to you? Do they not? They don't talk to you. They would talk to somebody at school. Yeah. Yeah. So their guidance counselors get all the information. They also can contact us directly as well. Um, I just was talking on the phone with one of our parents who we had last summer, for example, because okay. um, she wanted to enroll her student again. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is through the school the guidance counselors. So if they called you and they wanted to come, yes. then you would say call that principal. Right? No, I would say let's enroll you right now. Okay. And I would pull up the enrollment form, or I would say what's easiest? I can email it to you. I can text it to you, or we can just enroll right now on the phone. Okay. Yeah. And this particular project is for this summer, or are you thinking? This fund would be for the summer of 2019. Yes. Although we are running a version of it this summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, but I think, okay, so I, that was one of my questions too, but it sounds like whenever you get the money, you, if you're not implementing, you're planning, right? Mm -hmm. So you have cost to cover all your money. Yes, we understand that's that. That's why we fundraise all your money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, and then the measurement about reversing summer loss by months just to help. So the assessment that you use, tell me what that is. DRA, huh? which is. And so it's a it's a, like a typical like Thomas and Pinnell. I don't know if you're familiar with yes. that. Yeah. So it's the same the same exact idea. Okay. Um, and what you can do is look at the number of um, levels of reading within each grade level and estimate then. Um, how many months of growth based on how many levels the students jump? Because you would jump one year's worth of growth if you moved all the way through every reading level in second grade, for example. So you do all that testing. It doesn't happen when the kids go back to school. No, we do it. You do it. Week one and at the end, yeah. Okay. But we have a pilot coming up working with a diagnostic company called Let's Go Learn for this yeah. summer. If it works out. It'll take that burden off of us. Yes. Yeah. The district is asking us to run that pilot to try it out because they, they're thinking they want to use it. Because the district could us. be yes. doing this. That's what we've been. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just a exactly. Yes. So we're hopeful that this will work out and that they'll then continue using it. Okay. Yes. Do you get, um, when the students are um, kind of referred to you, do you get access to their, um, I guess, their, their records? in a sense, like their reading levels, what they were ending the school year on, what they've been working on. Do you get access to all that from the teachers? The, the, the district has been able to at various points and not able to at various points. Mm -hmm. um, it, seems to, it seems to kind of depend on honestly how much, how behind they are at the end of the school year, whether or not they're able to provide it with us, which is actually part of the reason why we do our own testing, because as you know, it's, we can't, you know, it's critical to know where kids are at. So when we can get that information, it, it really helps. We're not always able to get it from them. Do you then share with the schools? Like, do you have something that you send back to the school with the, with the yeah. children? Thing yeah, yeah, put together a report. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we share it with families as well. We do um, every other week progress reports with families and give give some suggestions and stuff too. Is that through a written newsletter, or do you actually see kids for families or care? We do both, but that we we formalize it through the written. Um, newsletter just to make sure it's like documented and you can see it. Right, we're doing a cool pilot this year too. I don't know if you've heard of POSIP, but um, we're going to be getting feedback. Um, are we going to do yeah, weekly, weekly, yeah. weekly feedback through text from parents where they roll up a report and we get trends on like what uh, the students experience of the blessed through the, through the family and guardian's eyes and we can respond to it immediately if they're in fires or things like that. We're kind of do the families get any kind of training or support? or? We do an open house with them the Thursday before it starts, um, and we share the program with them. The kids get to meet their teachers, um, we talk about what they can expect and how they can support, and then we do the send home um, progress reports, and then all um, teachers do that in like an initial phone call home to start to get to know the families, um, and we do a student survey, a family survey, where we get to know like, what for families who didn't come to open house to learn what they're hoping to get out of the summer. And tied to that, let's go learn pilot. We'll see if it works. All students will get to, if they have access to a computer, which is a barrier, but if they have access, they can continue their learning at home with 
um, less than what the Khan Academy or other are like targeting where they're at on their on their uh, level and, yeah. uh, in math and reading, and so it's optional. Like they'll but they'll have access to it to work on them, which is kind of cool. The 93 teachers, those are the Teach for America teachers getting trained over the summer. Yes. Yeah. How many of those are going to be continuing with the 2019-2020 year, or will they be wrapping up? So we require every teacher to teach for a minimum of two years. Um, most go on to teach beyond that, but all of the folks that go through the program in that summer are first year full-time teachers in MMPS the following uh, fall. Okay. Um, and importantly, the program is those 93 new teachers, but it's actually like the reason that adult ratio is so high is because we hire a bunch of coaches and mentor teachers and others that are also in the room with them. So it's not just kids getting taught by totally new teachers. So the computer that you were talking about, so this, the program that's available if they have access, is that something that can be on public computers here? Is that something they access on the so they don't have to have it in their home, they can yeah. access it yeah. anywhere. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> I noticed a lot of the components included in the Limitless Library. Mm -hmm. Who are you working with at National Public Library to operationalize those things? Yeah, so I don't know the exact contact because my one of my teammates is the one who's in charge of that. Um, but I think they've been working with the branch managers of the libraries closest to the schools that we're working at. I don't know their names off the top of my head. Um, but someone close to Jerry Baxter uh, Middle School. Yeah. So if you can't get a parent's signature, or you can't get with parents, then it's just that's that's you have to have that in order for the kid to come to the camp, obviously. Is that right? Yeah. And so do you find that even when you get that initial okay, whatever they're signing is, do you have any kind of feeling as to how that communication goes throughout the summer? Is that as challenging as I might think it is? The communication with the families? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it really just depends. We teach the teachers that they have to be very persistent. Um, they don't know what the parent's schedule is like, or the guardian's schedule. They have no idea. Um, so I actually would say it's pretty similar to the school year. We haven't found to be that much different. Right. Which is also really yeah hard. yeah so it's like similarly challenging yeah okay and who like when you're trying to recruit is everybody working on that to try to get to the families to get the kids who are identified on board and get the families to the signatures and yeah so we work with principals with guidance counselors we work with um, the um, heads of each cluster at MPS each of the four uh, four tiles. The community superintendents, yeah. Um, we work with different community organizations, um, the community specialists at schools. Okay. Yeah. It's sort of a joint effort because, in some ways, we're relying on MPS to get the word out and kind of go through the network. Right. And then we also right. try to plug in through our networks because, um, and our other day jobs at Rice County is, of course, we have partnerships with like 80 schools or something. So we have a network of communications too that will also kind of leverage and try to get try to identify the these kids. Okay, so we're good. All right. All right, so um, we make our suggestions to the mayor's office at the, I guess, the beginning of next week. And then their budget is finalized, you know, June 3. And so we give suggestions and then mayor and council do what they do. Perfect. So. Thanks for doing this, y'all. Yeah, so Regardless of how it should come for us, it's a combined effort. Yeah. So I really yeah. appreciate it. All right, well, we so appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, good afternoon. My name is Erin, and I am the Adult Education Program Manager at the National International Center for Empowerment. Um, and at NICE, I work alongside with my team members to empower refugees and immigrants in Nashville for now and generations to come. Uh, but through the perspective specifically of English language learning and English language acquisition. Um, and so I'll just go but kind of talk a little bit about NICE's history. Um, so NICE as an organization offers many substantial services and activities for refugees and immigrants, but I always tend to feel a real sense of pride when I get to say that our roots are in education. Um, our president and CEO, sorry, our founder, uh, Dr. Gatlin Thatch, 
uh, he came here um, as a refugee. And shortly after arriving in the United States, he actually began teaching other people how to read in English and speak in English. It started with his wife and some family, and then more friends and, and more friends and more friends, and it kind of spread out into the community, which is kind of how we ended up uh, doing more services than that. Um, employment seeking, um, job placement services, uh, health screening and health case management services, immigration services, and kind of the list goes on, uh, depending what the clients need. But again, I still feel kind of a little bit of a sense of pride knowing that really education is where um, we started back in 2005. Um, so since then, the Education Notice Program to, has grown to serving hundreds of people each year. Um, and it's really only been possible for us to grow that much and so quickly with our community support um, from our clients and our students, um, but also the support from our partners, partners and the support from the Community uh, Enhancement Fund, now Partnership Fund. Um, so in 2014, NICE received its first um, funding and support from the Community Enhancement Fund. And with that, we've been teaching ESL classes for several years at that point, but with that funding, we were able to grow pretty quickly, um, meaning we were able to offer more classes, um, offer and increase the size of those classes, um, move to new locations, um, and also hire and secure more qualified instructors, which led to greater persistence in the classroom. Um, and of course, you know, overall the goal to just improve the literacy of the adults that were seeking our services. Um, so since then, since that initial point, we've served over 3,000 students. Um, and just in this last year, we've served 945 individuals through our English as a Second Language Citizenship and pre-high school equivalency programs um, at night. Um, and we've had a lot of strategic partnerships over the years. Um, and since then, to kind of propel forward, um, and those include partnerships with Metro National Public Schools, um, churches, community organizations, um, National Public Library locations, um, and that's usually where we hold all of our classes. So they've been really great in donating in-kind space for us to expand and host all of those classes. Um, so we currently have five locations in South Nashville um, where we teach a variety of curricula. We have our life skills and workforce ESL curricula, curriculum. Um, our integrated civics and literacy curriculum, and our pre-high school equivalency curriculum, which focuses math, social studies, and reading, writing, and grammar, if you will. Um, we offer seven different levels um, of English class, and those levels actually correspond to a proficiency level as set by the National Reporting Standard System. Uh, so we start with the basic literacy from the very beginning, and we go all the way up to the most advanced, what you would assume would be prepared for a college level class. So we offer seven different levels. Um, and we also we offer the four pre-high school competency classes, citizenship class. We've actually expanded um, since 2017, and now we those are the additional library locations that we have now. Um, but and while all of these courses and these classes they really focus on the core skills of language learning, we do try to work with our partners. Um, so those ones that I listed before, and many many others um, in Nashville, to kind of integrate and incorporate their activities into our curriculum and what we do just to kind of show the students how it is that you can become more integrated into the community. Um, some things that kind of come to mind recently, uh, we've had council members come and speak to our students, um, especially when we had the general election going on. Um, we've done international nights. We've attended, the students have all attended the international nights at Glencliffe High School and John Overton High School. And actually, as soon as next week, we're gonna be hosting um, a big event at Glencliffe and inviting some of the mayor's office to come and speak about the transit plan. So these are great opportunities for students to kind of apply that kind of concepts they're learning in the classroom outside, which we really love and encourage. Um, but we do see lots of opportunities to keep enhancing our services and empower even more people um, through the program. We do, we do have a wait list. <laughs> um, now 50 people on the wait list um, waiting to seek out these services. Um, we've had to turn away quite a few people from the beginning of the year just due to space. Um, we just really don't have the space or right now the staff to kind of do more than a thousand people a year. Um, but we're really looking forward to opportunities to do so. Um, and other ways that we try to find out how we can enhance our services is by surveying the students. And so we do that twice a year and we ask them why it is they want to take English class um, and what it is that we can do to be better and serve them better. And not too surprisingly, um, most of them state that obtaining their high school diploma or the high school equivalency is one of the number one reasons why they do take English class to seek out higher paying jobs, 
move from the night shift to the day shift, um, but also post secondary opportunities with Nashville State Community College and other colleges here in Nashville. Um, also to obtain their citizenship, that's been a very that's been always there, but now it's much more prominent. Um, a lot of people are on the pathway to naturalization right now. But something that really caught our attention this last year was the overwhelming desire um, for our students to participate in their child's education, their children's education. Um, and that, so that was a box that was ticked kind of the most <laughs> on our survey from all of the parents. And what we, what we kind of gained from that survey experience, the knowledge we gained, was they want to be able to speak English at home with their children while they're doing the homework. Um, and they also want to be able to talk to the teachers and the staff at the school. Um, as those are two of their main concerns. Um, and so with that evidence there, but also our understanding that the, the crucial role the parents play in early childhood literacy, um, we want to aid our parents. Um, and they are parents, lots of them are parents, and most of them are kids in Metro National Public Schools. Um, we want to give them the strategies and the mechanisms, right, to kind of, along with the language skills, to help them keep doing this at home. Um, one of the biggest concerns I hear from the parents is, I'm not sure how to help my child at home when their homework is in English, and because I don't have the literacy skills, I need to read the homework or the letters that the parents send home. Um, so with the importance of the initiative with Blueprint um, and with Nashville and within our community, we've decided to initiate the New American Family Literacy Service, um, which is more of a, person, a purposeful intergenerational approach than we've had in the past. Um, so building on kind of the foundation we've already created for our adult education program, um, and kind of expand by incorporating children and family literacy activities and events to help uplift the entire family unit, um, whereas before it might seem a little more separate. Um, and just as a bit of background, NICE has actually offered um, a service to our students to help break down one of the biggest barriers to accessing really any service, whether it be education or social, um, but when that's finding a safe place for their children to be while they're attending class. Um, and so at each of our sites, we offer kind of a robust, <laughs> we have lots of volunteers, um, trained volunteers that actually very selflessly spend their time with the children while the parents are attending class. And so the parents attend class and then a few doors down is a classroom with children um, and volunteers who work together, um, play together, interact, engage in activities. And so while you've got this kind of community of adult learners happening, they come every week and they're excited to see each other and they encourage each other along their language journey. You also have this community of children who kind of come and see each other each week um, and adore the volunteers and adore the activities they create for them. And so these two things kind of happened organically, I would say. That's how I would describe it. Um, and we see this as the perfect opportunity really to contribute to the Nashville Literacy Collaborative and align ourselves with the blueprint um, for early childhood success that we now have um, with CPF. And so we don't want to just educate separately. We want to build on this opportunity to kind of bring um, the child and the parent together. Um, the child will demonstrate literacy skills, um, but the parent will also take away um, those strategies, those activities that they can use at home to help promote literacy. These events will mostly take the form um, of storybook reading and storytelling. Um, so having the children, giving the children a prompt um, to describe a time when, and then using that prompt through art, through visual literacy, um, having the parents meet with their kids once quarterly, and then having the kids kind of describe those experiences to the parents. Um, inviting um, MNPS staff, especially administration, especially from Glencliff, which is our biggest, most vibrant community of learners, um, to come and attend these events, to kind of engage with non-native English speaking parents on a more relaxed, fun environment um, outside the daily school. Um, environment is one of our top goals, um, and also maybe from the other elementary schools like Tuscan Elementary, where we do see a lot of immigrant refugee students. Okay, <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> no, no, no. no. All right. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, let me just clarify because I'm a little confused. Just about mm -hmm. to, how many people you serve a year? It was the. I thought the first screen said that in 2017 it was. 2,900 and something, but then you said something about 945. So is that is that cumulative up to 2017? Okay. So that's one since we first received okay. the community enhancement funding, um, and then just in the last year, um, the last fiscal year, we um, 
We serve 945 individuals. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's a cumulative number. That number at the bottom is the 29 of three. That's actually across all of our programs for 2017. But it's not cumulative. So the 3,000... Right. 3, the 2,903 mm -hmm. clients across all programs. Mm -hmm. But that actually didn't happen just in 2017, right? It happened since you've got... That, that was 2017. That was from our resettlement program, our employment programs, beyond the adult education program. So it and was just, just in 2017? Yes, it was oh. just in 2017. It was, I think the cumulative one was the one above um, the over 3,000 here since 2014. And that's specifically adult education clients, students. Yeah. Well, whereas the bottom <laughs> number is like, across all programs. So the 900, <laughs> we're just doing math, right, yeah. is part of the 2,900. It is, it yep, is. it's part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and is your program, as you propose it, just for Davidson County? Uh, yes, our target is Davidson County. It's specifically um, where most of the refugees and immigrants reside currently, which would be kind of in the Nolensville Pike, Thompson Lane Harding um, corridor. But we have seen lots of people, you know, moving out a little bit further towards Donaldson, towards Hermitage. Um, so with all the locations that we have, um, we try to target specific areas so that people have as much access, but it is Davidson County. Okay, because in, in the application, I'm not sure where, it says Davidson County and surrounding areas, mm -hmm. which you, we can't do. So, I mean, the, the money has to be for Davidson County residents. Mm -hmm. So we have a, our, our registration process, we verify everybody's proof, you know, proof of residence, and we verify everybody's residence with their driver's license or proof of residence. Mm -hmm. um, I think where we think of surrounding areas for us as those tip those tip regions where we don't normally touch. Um, for example, if you go along Bell Road towards 24, I mean, these are areas that for us are a little bit further out than we're normally used to reaching okay, to, but we will be targeting okay. still within that data. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so the, this, what you're requesting the money for is for a pilot. Right, so it's to continue the current adult education program that we have um, with the kind of free child care service that happens on the side, but also the um, adult literacy service um, and the implement implementation of the new program, which would focus on the quarterly family literacy activities and events. Um, so the storybook and the storytelling, but then also the other events that we have throughout the year. Um, for example, our, our annual student celebration where we actually invite all families to come together at the end of the year. So it would be those those two activities too, kind of added on to what we currently do with adult education. Good. All right. So the part that's new, so you currently have the adults, you currently have the kids. Mm -hmm. So the piece that's being added are the literacy events. Mm -hmm. The children literacy activities and then the family literacy okay. activities. Right now, on the academic book, it's, it's more of an organic, you know, we have, of course, we have these incredibly devoted volunteers who create these activities for the children to do that are simply amazing. Um, but so far, the approach hasn't been purposeful to really bring have parent and child time together. They do get separated once the ESL class or the pre-high school or citizenship class begins. Uh, but now we really see an opportunity um, with the number of kids that are coming each night and the number of pa parents in the program um, and the interest level from the city um, to really kind of integrate and create a special activity um, quarterly. Every night the children come for the children when they're in, in the room together with the volunteers and the instructors and then also quarterly with families together um, to kind of demonstrate what the kids have been working on and just overall kind of create this positive experience for the parents and the kids and the instructors. Um, all together, uh, because I think well, what I've seen at the end of the day is that the, the parents will put their kids above everything else, and um, they want to they, they want their kids to be doing something there. They don't want it to just be um, a babysitting service where they just kind of play and um, or take a nap or eat or something like that. They want it to be really engaging as well. So I think that's a step that we haven't taken before, and that would be a new, a definite new part of the program that we've never done before. 
developing a curriculum for that. Um, that includes the parents as well. So does everybody meet twice a week? Yes, yeah, so this, yeah, the schedule is a four hours a week total, twice a week. Um, lots of people want to attend more than <laughs> four hours a week, uh, but we just don't have the capacity right now to allow people to attend four or five, six times a week. Um, and based on trends for adults, four to six hours is six to eight hours is kind of the maximum of what people are able to commit to each week. And so do you know what the rate of like, consistent attendance is? Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting question. We have an open entry and exit program. Um, so we consistently enroll new parents every month, um, new students every month, and that's just to meet the individuals where they are in their life. <laughs> um, and so by doing that, we do have a lot of people come in and out of the program, but we also allow people to come in and out as they can. If they need to leave for vacation or sick purposes or whatever the reason is, um, they're allowed to re-enroll as soon as they're available. Uh, and so right now, on average, the data that I've <laughs> accumulated and studied myself is most people stay in the program for 8 to 12 weeks before they take a major break. And most people re-enroll in the program by the end of the year. Um, Lots of people do stay for the entire year and um, you know attend periodically, uh, but really eight to twelve weeks is kind of that sweet spot, if you will, for a lot of people and how often they stay. Um, and we don't have a retention number because we don't. It's up the personal goal of the student as to why they're in the program, and as long as we're helping them achieve that personal goal, that's what we're focused on. Not necessarily graduating or retaining people to an end of a time period. I focus more on persistence. How long is that particular student persisting in the class when they do decide to come to our class? And that's what we're really focused on uh, maintaining is if you are only available for three months or you know you're going to be traveling in the next six months, how can we increase your persistence in the program during that six month period? Um, and I would say currently we are on a wait list because there, there are so many people are attending. Normally in the past, I've had enough you know, fluctuation between enrollment periods that people will leave and I'll have spots open to enroll new students, people are not leaving right now. They're staying in the classes, and so that's why we have the wait list, um, which just tells me that our attendance is up um, when people are attending more regularly. All right, so part of that, part of that question, and you've answered it, I mean, I'm just wondering how you're going to get the outcomes, kind of with that open, people coming in, people leaving. Mm -hmm. So over the course of a year, these these three outcomes are over the course of a year. The one hundred and twenty dollars achieve a national standard for student advancement. Anyway, so so as far as adult learners enrolling, um, four hundred. Um, but thinking about how many we enrolled last year, and that was across all programs. I would say just within the English as a second language program alone, four hundred as an outcome that we can meet. So across all programs, I definitely feel comfortable with how many we can enroll. We test, uh, retest our, post-test our parents, retest, post-test, however you want to look at it, um, quarterly. So every three months, um, they take a standardized assessment. It's also given by the state, uh, under the Department of Labor. Um, and we measure their score and improvement from quarter to quarter. Um, and if they demonstrate a kind of crossing a threshold, if you will, of score, um, then they have demonstrated um, an improvement, um, which is where that 100 and, um, I'm sorry, um, where the parent and family kind of improvement comes from. And I would say that at any given time, at Glen Club High School, uh, we have about 20 to 25 children in the child care with about 10 or more volunteers. Um, and with new parents coming in and out, um, and with the seasons changing as well, you get a fluctuation of children attending as well. Um, so the 80 children is right on par. Um, and then combined with the family literacy events, um, especially throughout the summer, um, that's when we really pick up a lot of, of activity with parent and child time together when the children are out of school. Um, and we usually offer a summer series. In the past, it's been coffee and conversation because we had a local coffee shop on Hillsville Pike um, where we invite the families to come together and just experience kind of a night with community, national community members and other immigrants and refugees um, and kind of see what life is like outside of our traditional classroom walls. Um, and so I definitely think those opportunities pick up. Um, there's lots of events over the summer where we encourage our families to come out together as well. Um, including uh, Ramana and Zilli Bikali as well, so we do a lot of things around that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. You really have to stop. <laughs> stop <laughs> <you going. laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time.